here you have two wrongs, which because they're less than one, at least make the less wrong. Right? Okay, so this is uh, this is a very helpful technique. This is this is how you this is the best way I know to evaluate policies offline. Uh, and empirically it works quite well, but I also wanted to discuss the exploration uh, for just a few minutes. Uh, so if we go back to this problem, you need to be if you're actually in the online loop, you need to be choosing the probability of the actions in order to optimize things well. And th there's, there's several techniques which are you know basic approaches, but there's a, a new approach that we worked out. Uh, so this is policy elimination. And this is this has this new approach has two properties. One of them is you can understand it, um, which is uh, a big improvement over what was previously there, and also um, it gives you the optimal fit. So if you have a set of policies, uh, we're going to have some minimum probability of exploration, and then we're going to have our empirical reward estimate. So this is your double robust estimate. So when you have random actions, you can, you can get an estimate of the value of the policy. So at each time step, you choose a distribution over your remaining policies. So that for every remaining policy, you expect the variance of your value estimate is small. So let's go back here. When p hat goes to zero, you have a problem. Your variance is going to blow up. And that does sound good. So the tricky thing in choosing your exploration distribution well is you need to make sure that your probabilities don't get too small. Um, so you choose the distribution over your policies carefully. You observe your features. You draw. Uh, okay, so you project the distribution on policies into be a distribution on actions. So if you draw a random policy and you evaluate it against the features, you get an action. So a distribution on policies induces a distribution on actions. And then you, you draw your action, you observe your reward, and then uh, you can use bounds to, uh, to reduce the set of policies. <coughs> That's only reducing very slowly that set of policy. So it depends on what you mean by very slowly. So uh, what you can prove is that for all sets of policies, for all distributions, uh, let's imagine the world is IID, expected some distribution generating the data. Uh, with high probability, they start to regret the scourge of K log number policy. So if we're doing supervised learning, there would be no dependence on k. k is the number of actions. If you do epsilon greedy type things and you optimize your epsilon well, you end up getting a uh, two-thirds power. So if you have a million events, the amount of exploration required for this approach is a factor of 10 less than for epsilon greedy. And that's, that's, uh, that's much better. So these kinds of, there's essentially two families of algorithms that are now known for solving conditional band problems. This is, this is the new family. Uh, there's an older one called EXP4. Anybody familiar with EXP4? Joel, Joel knows it, but okay. Um, that one is kind of more complex. Um, that's a, for a finite dimensional set of policies. I mean, for a finite size set of policies. Yeah. If it's parametric. You can get a VC dimension like result if you want. <coughs> okay, so the, the, all of the policies, all the approaches, which can give you the square root dependence, have this property that they kind of mix together exploration and exploitation character uh, throughout. throughout the, the entire learning process. So one problem with this algorithm is that uh, it's, 
computationally slow because we're enumerating policies and checking things. And then, of course, it doesn't really work. Yes? Just the question of the, like, the, the setting and the, the yeah. different actions. That, how would you compare that to like, an uh, econometric approach with the, like your random utility discrete choice framework? Could you relate it to that literature? What is that? I, I think the uh, econometric approach isn't, uh, I don't understand what that means well enough to answer. Uh, what I can tell you is that um, we use these kinds of algorithms for things like setting the reserve price and the options, okay. and the keyword options. Mm -hmm. and, and this was the approach which worked well. Okay, so uh, a disadvantage of this is it's slow. It turns out there's a way to fix that, at least in theory. So if you have a uh, optimization work. So what I mean by that is you see a supervised learning algorithm. They can run the same policy set. It turns out that you can employ the ellipsoid algorithm uh, to get something which is poly TK log of the policies computation. So this, this is kind of amazing because this is, this is one of the rare times in my life when uh, I took something that was order pi and made a logarithm. It's, a, it's an exponential reduction in my computation required. Now, who, who knows ellipsoid? All right, so anybody who knows ellipsoid knows that it doesn't actually work. Because ellipsoid is, it's, it's one of these theoretical hammers that lets you say, ah, oh, it's one of time. But the quality is about 12 in this particular case. <coughs> okay, so I think I'm, I'm about done. Uh, over in fact. Um, Making the textual bandit learning really efficient, not just kind of theoretically efficient, I think is one of the main challenges which remains. Um, uh, that's this question. And then there's also the more complex algorithms, the nonlinear algorithms in a parallel setting, which I think are, is, is a substantial challenge. Um, so those are two of the things that I'm working on. Things that I think is limiting GPUs is uh, if you have a single GPU, and and the single GPU tends to be pretty limited in terms of just the amount of memory it has, and in terms of the bandwidth. I mean, it's just, you just have a single GPU, and maybe you can get a computer which can have up to eight GPUs, but you only have eight GPUs. Uh, one of the things that I want to think about is what happens when you have a cluster of GPUs, because then if you once you can ship things over the network interface, uh, suddenly it becomes possible to scale much more than you could otherwise do. And it seems a, a trick which um, I learned at Microsoft is that networking is actually phenomenal these days because people figure out how to create large clusters which have full bisection bandwidth. And that means that you can connect every pair of nodes and they talk to each other in both directions at full speed without ever clogging the network. So, so, so for example, if you have a choice between buying a, net, a cluster with gigabit Ethernet or some kind of expensive in band type communication, are they, do you actually see these advantages for paying the extra money to get? Or is, is, he, is gigabit Ethernet enough? So, gigabit Ethernet, I think, is not enough these days. And the minimum that I would consider is 10 gigabit Ethernet. Um, and I would want to make that either full bisection bandwidth or pretty near to that. So the, whether or not you have full bisection bandwidth has to do with exactly how you create your switch topology, which wires up different racks in your cluster. Um, we're actually looking at 40 gigabit Ethernet. 
you don't believe in Infinity Band type products, I don't know. So Infinity Band is, is nice. The thing which I found a little bit frustrating about Infinity Band is that Infinity Band to Ethernet doesn't work very particularly well. And uh, so Infinity Band gives you 56 gigabits per second, but 40 gigabit Ethernet gives you 40 gigabits per second. But it's, it's fairly close. Mm -hmm. And because you don't have to uh, change protocols, it ends up being superior because you're talking to Ethernet everywhere else. I think Infinity Band gives you remote direct memory access and much lower latency mm -hmm. if that's what's important. Than that's so you can do so re remote direct memory access with, through Ethernet. That's a efficiency property of the card. And their cards which actually support both Infinity Band and Ethernet. Um, right. The latency is to some extent there, but um, I think once you get things up to sort of microsecond scales, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that much. I think both from a programming point of view than a theoretical performance point of view, sometimes it makes it easier. I haven't actually programmed Infinity Band, so I don't have a good sense of exactly how you use it from a programming point of view. So another question with respect to configuration, how, how much memory do you have per node, or, or maybe more precisely, how much memory can each of your processes use on your nodes that, to make it, and, and is there something important about that where it no longer becomes even feasible unless you have X available for the kinds of algorithms you're talking about? Yeah, so for the kinds of algorithms I'm talking about, you have the entire model and the various optimization stuff on a node. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be the case that the model fits on an individual node. Mm -hmm. Now for the machines that we had access to at Yahoo, that meant that we were running around with like four gigabytes or so. Uh -huh. So that, that limited the model size to some extent because with LBFTS in particular, you need about a factor of 10 more memory uh, than, than just showing the raw model itself. Mm -hmm. um, so but but there's, there's a change coming, which is that servers can support a lot of RAM. So, uh, the machines that we're getting right now are 192 gigabytes. It's, uh, it's quite a lot. Yeah, they, but it seems like this may have some dramatic, maybe direct or subtle implications on the algorithm design with respect to how much you're holding in memory uh, in these experiments versus what you might do in the future. Yeah. Right. <coughs> yeah. Like when you, how often do you do your algorithm? You don't, did you not even touch this? Uh, I guess, I mean, so I didn't really describe this, but um, VW creates cache files. Uh -huh. So I didn't want to store the, the data in RAM because I needed to reserve the RAM for the model. Right. So I read the data in this text. Uh -huh. I created a binary format and dropped it to disk. Uh -huh. And then I would read back over the binary format when I needed to decode the data. Okay. And that binary format is the order of what? How much memory? Uh, I mean, it, it's just kind of, it, it's just a compressed binary format. It's, it's similar to the text, so maybe a vector 10 better. Okay. Okay. So if you have 192 memory, that would help a lot. I mean, yeah. caching the data in, in RAM becomes much more feasible when you have 192 gigabytes of RAM. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, so, so uh, it's interesting because like uh, this whole uh, issue of uh, RAM speed and uh, ban bandwidth plus bandwidth is really critical for anything to do with GPUs, and yeah. and. Once you start talking about 192 gig on a note, something similar starts coming up. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? I guess I was wondering if you can expand a little bit more, switch of topics, but on the Oracle assumption over your yeah. policy. Is so that why you're, you're getting a lot of that power in terms of the log of the policy space? Yes. So, w in fact, you can't do it without an Oracle assumption. So if you have an arbitrary policy space, yeah. there's no way to search it yeah. efficiently other than linear time, right. right? So in practice, we have learning algorithms. These learning algorithms can, can search through policy spaces uh, very efficiently. Uh, so we're, we're, mad, we're thinking of the learning algorithm as an oracle searching through the policy space. So we're, we're imagining that we can give a data set to an oracle, and in unit time, they can return to us uh, the policy which optimizes which minimizes the error rate on that data set. I see. Right. I see. So we're running, essentially what happens is when we're playing around with this lipsoid algorithm, yeah. we're running a learning algorithm over and over again yeah. uh, in order to uh, extract a good policy. And is there a way to relax that somehow, like have a some kind of a noisy oracle that doesn't quite optimize it and still get some tight 
computation results. I haven't thought about that carefully. Should have been an expert, you know, kind of one of these noisy experts. Yeah, so you think about sort of an approximate oracle. Um, for this particular algorithm, I would say probably not. Okay. Because at least when you relaxed it, it would, the errors would be made badly. Uh, it may be that one does exist where you can tolerate errors. All right, thank you.